define who we are. Engineered to take you from A to B. Mile after mile. Day by day. Objects whose only purpose is to ease your daily journey. Built on technology with a conscience and beauty. Small pieces put together, designed to give you a feeling of a collected whole. A feeling of one perfect object. One bicycle. So this uh, speech is called Hype Wars, and uh, here are my kids. So those are my two first kids on a bike, and they still use a bike. Uh, somehow many people de-learn it, they remember their, their bikes uh, from childhood. But uh, actually right now there's some kind of, uh, in the cities, an epic battle going on between um, bikes and cars. So there's some kind of format war going on. And um, the cities at large are dominated by cars. And uh, if you claim the opposite coming here from Kiev, uh, I have the proof uh, to the contrary right here. Um, so the cars are basically um, taking over the city or the, the transportation bit of cities. And the problem with that is basically that they kill a ton of people. Um, so uh, I think was it in uh, John's uh, speech, you, he talked about uh, air pollution. So in these 11 million car kills here, I don't have six and a half million killed, uh, but four and a half million killed by air pollution that's um, caused by cars. There's a ton of other reasons that, that they will kill, um, or ways in which they kill. And uh, then I've tried to compare it with something that people normally think is frightening, so infectious diseases. It's impossible to really get uh, clear numbers on how many people die of infectious diseases because the World Bank um, puts in prenatal death and stuff like that, so I've tried to add them up. Uh, so all sorts of dangerous diseases like AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, Alzheimer's not even uh, infectious. The flu, you would have to add half a million to that. So all in all, cars kill more than all the dangerous diseases we're afraid of. So um, to combat that, um, there's, there's a way of going about it that, that probably a lot of urban planners are going to talk about, so install bikeways and so on. I believe that is also an important battle, but also there's some way, you know, when people adopt the product, there's a whole sociological aspect to it. So we know um, the war between uh, VHS and Video 2000. If you're old enough, uh, there's um, Microsoft versus, uh, so, so Windows platform versus Linux or iOS. So there are all sorts of these format wars going on, and and what make them win tend to be more sociological than actually uh, kind of based on uh, pure economics. Uh, so uh, I've kind of looked at what is it that make a car super powerful, and it's actually their approach to design. So they're highly visible, um, meaning looking good, looking characteristic. Uh, they're very simple to use, you know, so if you made cars like bikes, you would have two stick shifts, you would have one pedal, brake pedal for, for each wheel. Um, they would be highly complex, you wouldn't want them. They're integrated into one object, so you think a car is one object, but it's actually you know, roughly 20,000 parts you're looking at, but you think it's an object. Um, and then they're durable, that's, that's kind of um, uh, self-explanatory. So some people think, ah, oh, this is a design, so this is about exclusivity, this is like high-end stuff. Well, actually, it's not really the case. So uh, um, cars can be very easily distinguished one from another, even uh, the super cheap ones. So uh, people do not have a problem distinguishing, let's say, uh, a Lada from a Skoda going a little bit back. Um, or, you know, it's, it's, it's a universal for cars, it's not specific to one segment of cars. Uh, whereas bikes, so this picture is not totally fair, but they're not really distinguishable. So even if you uh, have beautiful Italian racers like Pinarello bikes, 
The moment you scrape off the graphics, you have no clue which bikes you're dealing with. Which bike you're dealing with. So as, as mentioned, they, they are very complex. So uh, the, the, the more gears you have, the more things that can break, the more celebrated they are. Quite contrary to this kind of integrative approach to cars. Um, so this is basically what I've been trying to do with the bikes I've designed. I've tried to integrate them. This is an example from a Danish motorcycle from uh, back in the days called Nimbus, where they integrated the, the, the transmission system into a cadenic shaft. So this was uh, the first bike I designed. And um, this is like the latest uh, generation of that. It's still uh, chainless, although now it's a belt drive. Uh, the mud guard is integrated. So there are tons of kind of in integrative uh, features. This bike is kind of a little bit more silly. Um, this is the Amsterdam, the MS bike, uh, again, uh, integrated transmission. Um, and like cars, we kind of tend to have generations with these bikes. So this is the latest generation of the Amsterdam bike. I hope you can see the similarity. But this is, uh, you know, th they're 10 years apart, these two products. And this one is electric, by the way. This is another electric bike, the Oco. Again, you have integrated mud guards. You have tons of stuff you wouldn't integrate to make it seem as one object. You cannot start branding an object. You cannot start convincing people to buy one object if they don't think it's one object. So yeah, this was the one I wrote in on. So the idea with this one is you, uh, the locking system is integrated. So you can unlock that, use it to lock around a pole. If you cut it, you actually break the structural integrity of the bike, so you can vandalize it, but it doesn't really make sense to steal it because it's going to break if you're fat enough. This is the latest generation of that same bike. This is a cargo bike. So um, as you saw, the, we also made electric bikes. So that's another kind of format battle that I see out there, the EVs that people celebrate. Wow, we're having all of these EVs coming. But actually, it's not really true. Uh, very few EVs are on the market. So um, the latest numbers are, are a little bit old, so, so they might not resonate with you. But in 14, uh, you had in Germany, so the biggest European market, 25,000 um, electric cars. To compare with, you had uh, two and a half million electric bikes. So uh, these are actually the game changers, the electric bikes and not the electric cars. Uh, the electric uh, cars had in the meantime been subventioned in Germany by one billion euro of state money or public money uh, to compare with the EVs to achieve a, a number that's hundredfold that had received zero public uh, support. So zero euro. Uh, support for uh, electric bikes, although they're way better for our planet. So some other kind of um, odd thing is people believe that we'll be flying around in cities like the Jetsons. And funny enough, I've actually also designed one of these objects, although I don't really believe in their viability for the future. So here it is. Uh, it's a product. <laughs> So they say it's a flying car, but actually it's certified as a truck. So you can pre-order it, um, but you've got a flying truck and not a flying car. Um, uh, it's for the American market only. Uh, the, the thing is that um, this future, a lot of people believe in it. So this is a German venture called Volocopter that's heavily funded. Uh, this one is the one that Uber has invested in. Uh, this is the uh, Google uh, Z Aero. And uh, here is Airbus's own project. So you'd think if people that big, so big corporates invest in it, uh, that it has to happen. Uh, but I can assure you this will not happen uh, because it's basically just hype. So, um, to, so, so this is air security, my, my way of visualizing air security. Last year, in 2017, you had 79 people all over the world die from air security. If you had to implement uh, the, um, the manned uh, drones today, you would have the, roughly the same equivalent of death for drones that you have with cars. So um, to compare with uh, last year uh, here in Ukraine, you had 2,317 people die in cars. So who's going to tell people, hey, we've got this great new technology, and 
like a whole bunch of people are going to die. So th that, I think, is going to be a very hard sell. Of course, these numbers have, in fact, in hacking challenges with security or terrorism uh, issues. But the main reason it's not going to happen is people don't want a fan constantly over their head. So the cities in this world, like uh, Sao Paulo and New York, where you have most people tra um, traveling around with these type of objects or helicopters, uh, people are sick and tired of them, and they're heavily regulated. Uh, you have a few thousand people actually using them. How are you now going to move like millions and hundreds of millions of people from the cities over these objects? It's just not going to happen. Of course, it doesn't mean the technology itself is bad. So, so they have successes. I don't know if you want to say uh, war is good, but uh, at least they have proven very efficient for kind of uh, war, as war machines. And also in territories with very low infrastructure, such as uh, in, on the African continent, you have tons of super interesting startups that are, are drone-based. So they're not bad in themselves, but they're just not an urban mobility solution. Um, and here again, you have other technologies that are not as hyped. So for instance, lighter than air vehicles, Amazon and actually two other main global players want to, over that same continent, over Africa, uh, deploy tiny airships uh, to compete with satellites to provide telecommunication all over that continent. That's very likely. It's not a hype thing. And you have tons of other, so this is a Lockheed Martin working uh, machine out there you can buy. Um, this, in terms of sustainability, is a much more interesting product because you don't need any e energy to lift it up. Um, so you could actually, if you really wanted to, make zero emission airborne traffic tomorrow with this type of technology, yet very few speak about it. This is another venture. In Denmark, we have uh, Siemens uh, and Vestas that are looking into how to transport their windmills because basically most roads now are too small to the big type of um, air windmills we have. So getting uh, windmills from A to B with uh, lighter than air um, aircraft such as uh, these type of um, machines is, is very doable and it's being researched. So looking at the big picture, what I think we have now is some kind of uh, technological hegemony. People think that because um, Airbnb and Uber and so on are coming from the US that it's determined it's going to happen. Uh, I say not really, you know, it's, it's a choice we have. We, um, it's, it's a thing that's being propagated from people with a certain vision. So Ray Kurzweil with his whole singularity concept is a very popular du jour type guy in terms of, so a lot of follow his visions. I got to know him because I studied philosophy very early on and his vision for um, human ethics was that it was, would be propagated into space by ant-sized robots. So let's just agree that this is highly speculative. It's just a guy who has crazy ideas. We can follow them or we can choose not to follow them. So um, just to tell you that there was an alternative out there. So this is old uh, Soviet technology. So this turbojet uh, powered uh, train built in the 60s actually worked very well until it had a fatal accident and then they, they killed the project. But it actually had uh, speeds that remind you of the French uh, TGV which were formidable, and the TGV has you know, since had a lot of success. So there was like a whole bunch of alternative uh, technologies out there. The Sputnik became mainstream for satellites today, so we know that lighter than, um, sorry, ground effect aircrafts was actually technically super uh, efficient uh, aircrafts, and a whole bunch of them were built. But again, the, the Soviet soft power um, you know, it's close to zero. So they cannot convince that because they're making them, the rest of the world should buy them. So uh, I'm, I'm not saying that we should get into some kind of ideological battle again, but I'm just saying that we need to kind of reappropriate technology and, and make it about humans. So this is a Copenhagen letter that a friend of mine, uh, Thomas Mesen Mygdal, has drafted in, in Denmark and got a lot of sig uh, people to sign this letter that, that technology needs basically to be about what we want, about the future we want. We can't just um, engineer a future without a vision for the future. 
So a lot of the problems we have today uh, in terms of uh, CO2 emissions are actually just a, technologically, uh, a failure of technology. So we had alternatives. So uh, in 1900, most cars in the US were electric. The fastest car was electric, called a Riker Torpedo. I guess you can see which one it is. Um, somehow Ford demolished that. Um, and we took a different path, a path where we now have to look at sustainable development goals to kind of uh, make do, and our world, objectively uh, looking in terms of environment and global warming, is fairly fucked. So, uh, as I see it, the main thing is about securing our human habitat without a place where we humans can stay. Many of these goals become meaningless. So, there are tons of technologies out there that can help us achieve that. Actually, um, uh, Paul addressed one of them, so the smart grid, uh, the electric smart grid, I think it's going to happen and it's a great thing, but it's super hyped compared to having a thermal grid that you could deploy. If you, if you manage to deploy a thermal grid to kind of uh, harness all of the energy out there already, uh, reuse it, the supermarkets was an example, uh, we would save way, way, way more energy. We'd actually shut down the, the gas from Russia from one day to the other. Um, and have much bigger savings than we have with an electrified future. Not that I don't think the future will be electric. So then the uh, self-driving car, again, this is a thing. It's not going to happen. So the MIT uh, research that uh, Annette referred to is actually totally bogus because, um, of course, they've done proper research, but they've done research as if we live in La La Land. So, um, so meaning that um, it's true, you could have um, these cars service everything, but for one, in their research, they assume that you're not uh, like uh, one to five people in these cars, but you are six to eight. So this is, no car can do this. This is, this are, uh, these are shuttles. These are uh, shuttle buses, these are not cars. So that's one thing. It's not a car future, it's a bus future. The other thing is that, um, they, they also presuppose that we're going to say, well, ownership of cars is going to end right away. They also presuppose that we're going to say to all handicapped, uh, all pets, and cars that they cannot drive around the block while we're in a meeting. Uh, so now you've got to regulate uh, against uh, poor blind people, telling them, no, yeah, you have now a car you could use, but you're not, you wouldn't be able to use it. So, so actually, research to today shows that probably car usage with such devices would go up by 67%. So basically, you're just going to worsen the problem we have with cars by choosing driverless cars. So I'm not saying they don't exist. This is actually my car. I'm just uh, showing off. And uh, the way I think it's going to go is you're going to have driverless agricultural machines. So this is actually a Denfoss uh, experiment, this with the Davis, so, which is fully working. So, so agricultural machines um, already have a satellite connection. They are, you know, if it goes wrong, they're not going to kill that kid that stands uh, out in the field because there's going to be no kid standing out in that field. And um, so, so, so the whole thing is actually prepped. So this is not like uh, in the future. This is now. So, so agricultural machines are going to go driverless. Then you will have big convoys. So Siemens have some pretty cool technologies for that. They're also going to go driverless because you can kind of seclude them. And um, you also have a lot of energy uh, savings going in there. And then this MIT research we're talking about, it's going to be about buses. So buses might end up being public and not private. So, so it's a very different future than the car lobby uh, actually imagined themselves. Anyway, the point with all of this is that we can't let ourselves kind of just be led on by hype, and we have to uh, focus on the bigger vision. So um, there, there's, a, there's a very big uh, correlation between the, the future we imagine that we'll have, so this kind of Star Trek future, you know, they, they, they propose that we would have mobile phones. So, so it's, it's fun to see when we project something, the likelihood of it happening is actually bigger. So we need a vision. The, the, the engineering tomorrow will not uh, come from the ground, but it's about designing a world that you actually want to engineer. So 
again, my, myself, I'm I come from design. So design has uh, a bunch of tools you can deal uh, you, you can use to deal with such problems. So, so for one, uh, design questions assumptions. So they're going to. So if you ask a designer build a, a hospital, they're going to ask, "Am I not building health first?" And then we can see if we actually need hospitals. Um, it's about understanding people. So who are we servicing? And uh, they are they are good at. Oh, we are good at navigating complexity. So the fact that things. Um, are not very certain that the outcomes are not certain is not a problem. It's actually kind of cheerful for designers. And then designers are used to kind of transcend actuality. So when you design a whole new thing, it's not something that necessarily exists. It's a thing that you think the world needs. So, so my guess, there's a big uh, kind of way of dealing with this hype and a big way of dealing with this kind of vacuum of proper vision that designers can help with. So that was my uh, two words.